Russ Dothit, should he need an introduction, is an opinion columnist for the New York Times. He replaced Bill Kristol in 2009 and is the youngest of their columnists. In fact, he was the youngest ever in Times history um, when he was appointed then. He writes about religion, politics, current events, and absolutely everything um, with a perspective that skews decidedly more conservative than the newspaper's base readership. Uh, in this epoch of self-conscious political polarization, this calcified even tribal cultural stances that we bemoan and then set right back into, um, the f consistency with which he steps into the fray and turns out engaging, well-considered, easygoing, but very thought-provoking and knowingly unpopular perspectives is in itself a really profound character witness. Um, would that we all had that kind of courage. Uh, Mr. Douthat's books include Bad Religion, How We Became a Nation of Heretics from 2012, um, and then Privilege, Harvard, and the Education of the Ruling Class, and with a co-author, Rehan Salam, Grand New Party, How Republicans Can Win the Working Class and Save the American Dream. Prying, prior to... <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, prior to joining the New York Times, he was a senior editor at The Atlantic and continues to write film reviews for the National Review. Um, taking courage in both hands, he now presents us with, I would argue, an even more vulnerable piece of reporting and analysis with To Change the Church, Pope Francis and the Future of Catholicism. You look around this bookstore, probably second only to the range of books that we have currently on display or hiding in various shelving arrangements of a dis certain orange-skinned, distinctively quaffed caricature on his book, I would venture is the number of books that we have about Pope Francis. Um, some of them simply cash in on the celebrity status of the current um, Pope of Rome. Uh, others are more analytical. They take a progressive take and tend to have a fairly gloating tone. Um, the conservative ones skew alarmist and vein-popping in some cases. Um, and now as of Tuesday, there is To Change the Church, in the introduction of which, um, with disarming frankness, Mr. Jethit offers readers an account of his own personal spiritual history and this, this, the unique um, circumstances, as perhaps anybody has, but his are very unique, um, of his membership in the Catholic Church um, from, from teenage years up until now. Um, the many layers of sort of liminal experience in the Catholic Church and in our cultural debates um, both in the, bring for a really, really incisive take, um, both on the changing roles of the papacy in the modern world, its media saturation, um, and in the rumblings of dogmatic edict, edits that, that we hear either bewailing them or beatifying them. Um, whether you are Catholic, of the cradle or convert, cafeteria or classical variety, um, or are religiously disinclined and cannot for the life of you understand what this big deal is about. Dothid provides an admirably clear lay of the land from a very specific perspective. Um, yes, but he incisively lays before you as the reader for his consideration, his take on Catholicism today in beautifully described context. Um, we're very excited to w welcome him to Politics and Prose and please join me in welcoming him. <laughs> Um, that was an incredibly kind introduction, um, one that I'm probably not worthy of. Uh, and I need to begin this by just saying, welcome to the harrowing of hell, or the descent into the dead, or whatever, whatever Holy Saturday description you'd like to use. Um, no, more seriously, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, this is indeed a book about um, Pope Francis, and it is a book that uh, takes up some of the particular controversies of his reign as pope and often takes a somewhat critical perspective on his pontificate. Uh, but it's also a book that strives, probably not entirely successfully, but does at least strive to contextualize his papacy and provide a kind of explanation of where Catholicism was and is upon his ascent to the papal throne and from that context what makes his papacy so interesting, controversial, potentially church-changing, potentially world-changing, and so on. Um, and since a lot of debates, particularly ones in which I am involved, tend to get to the sort of uh, 
vein popping arguments fairly quickly. I, I thought I would try as an experiment in this in this talk, which is one of the first I've given about the book, so I apologize in advance for all the experimentation. I thought I'd try and divide the talk into um, a little bit of reading from the beginning of the book, um, followed by some extemporaneous discussion, um, with the extemporaneous part being an attempt to briefly describe um, what Francis has done, why it matters, and why it's controversial. Uh, but the portion from the book is just, it's from the first chapter, and it's more of a kind of contextualization. It sort of sets the stage for this pontificate and tries to uh, give a sense of why it's so hard to be the Pope um, and why uh, that difficulty and Francis's particular responses to those difficulties are so very, very interesting. So I'll begin by reading um, and continue um, continue with um, some words that are not in the text itself. Uh, once I've set some of the stage, I think. So this is from chapter one of my book. Uh, the chapter is called The Prisoner of the Vatican. Um, <clears throat> At the center of earthly Catholicism, there is one man, the Bishop of Rome, the Supreme Pontiff, the Vicar of Christ, the Patriarch of the West, the Servant of the Servants of God, the 266th, give or take, an anti-pope successor of St. Peter. This has not changed in 2,000 years. There was one bishop of Rome when the church was a persecuted minority in a pagan empire, one bishop of Rome when the church was barricaded into a Frankish redoubt to fend off an ascendant Islam, one bishop of Rome when the church lost half of Europe to Protestantism, one bishop of Rome when the Ancien Regime crumbled, one bishop of Rome when the 20th century ushered in a new era of growth and persecution for Christianity around the globe. But all the other numbers that matter in Roman Catholicism have gotten somewhat larger. When Simon Peter was crucified upside down in Nero's Rome, there were at most thousands of Christians in the Roman Empire. When Martin Luther nailed his theses to the Wittenberg door, there were about 50 or 60 million Christians in all of Europe. There were probably 200 million Catholics worldwide when Pope Pius IX's Syllabus of Errors condemned modern liberalism in 1864. And there were probably about 500 million a century later when the Second Vatican Council attempted a partial reconciliation with modernity. And now, well, to start in the red-hatted inner circle, there are more than 200 cardinals, roughly 5,100 bishops, 400,000 priests, and about 700,000 sisters in the contemporary Catholic Church. Worldwide, the church, church dwarfs other private sector and governmental employers, from McDonald's to the US federal government to the People's Liberation Army. And that's just the church as a corporation. The church as a community of believers is vastly larger. In 2014, one-sixth of the world's human beings were baptized Catholics. Their estimated numbers, more than a billion and a quarter. Catholic means, here comes everybody, wrote James Joyce in Finnegan's Wake. That was in the 1920s, when there were about 300 million Catholics, two-thirds of them in Europe. Now there are more Catholics in Latin America, more in Africa and Asia, than there were in all the Joycean world. Now the papacy has never been an easy job. 30 of the first 31 died as martyrs. Popes were strangled, poisoned, and possibly starved during the, during the papacy's 10th century crisis. Pius VI was exiled by French revolutionary forces. His successor was exiled by Napoleon. Pius XII's Rome was occupied by Nazis. Five popes at least have seen their cities sacked by Vandals, Ostrogoths and Visigoths, Normans and a Holy Roman Emperor. These are extreme cases, but even the pleasure-loving pontiffs of the Renaissance found the office a bit more punishing than they expected. Since God has given us the papacy, let us enjoy it, Giovanni di Lorenzo de' Medici is supposed to have said upon being elected as Leo X, but his eight years as pope included a poisoning attempt, constant warfare in the first days of the Reformation. He died at 45. Now, Huns and Visigoths no longer menace today's popes, as far as we know, and their odds of being poisoned are mercifully slim. But alongside the continued dangers of high office, like the assassin's bullet that struck John Paul II, there are new and distinctive pressures on the papacy. The speed of mass communications, the nature of modern media, means that popes are constantly under a spotlight. Papal corruption would be an international scandal rather than distant rumor. Papal misgovernment leads to talk of crisis in every corner of the Catholic world. And papal illness or incapacity can no longer be hidden. And aging pontiffs face a choice between, occasion, between dying in public, essentially as John Paul II did, 
or taking his successor's all but unprecedented step of resignation. And in the age of media exposure, the Pope's role as a public teacher is no longer confined to official letters, documents, papal bulls, not just every sermon, but every off-the-cuff utterance, including the one we just had this week about the possibility of hell's non-existence, can whirl around the world before the Vatican press office has finished getting out of bed or returned from an afternoon espresso. <laughs> and theological debates uh, and theological F experts are left to debate whether the magisterium of the church, that lofty sounding word for official Catholic teaching, includes in-flight chats with reporters or private phone calls from the Pope to members of the faithful. Now in past centuries, the Pope's authority survived some of the papacy's worst occupants, from the 16th century Borgias to the 10th century villain John XII, who allegedly raped and murdered pilgrims because their sins were out of sight and mostly out of mind for Catholics fortunate enough not to live in Rome or its environs. And across those same centuries, the papacy's claim to be a rock of unchanging teaching seemed more solid because casual papacy, papal utterances and speculations remained personal and private. Now, though, the pope is a global celebrity with all the scrutiny that entails, and the Vatican has mostly encouraged this shift towards papal stardom. As the papacy lost its claim to secular power, a papal cult was increasingly fostered among faithful Catholics which treated the living occupants of Peter's See in a style usually reserved for long departed saints. While the popes of the early church were almost all declared saints, between the fall of Rome in the 20th century, only 30 popes out of 200 were canonized. But two of the last five popes have been declared saints, one has been beatified, and two have been declared servants of God, the first step towards sainthood. And there will be a clamor, albeit maybe from different camps within the Catholic faithful, for both the current pope and his still living predecessor to join those ranks once they've passed to their reward. Now, in fairness, recent popes probably have exceeded some of their medieval and early modern predecessors in sanctity, but the trend still suggests a very important transformation in how the papal office is presented and perceived both among Catholics and in the wider world. The popes of the past struck monarchical poses and claimed sweeping political as well as spiritual powers. But with those claims came an implicit acknowledgement of their worldliness, which in turn invited Catholics to treat them as ordinary mortals, sometimes corrupt, sometimes foolish, sometimes in need of hectoring and correction, even at risk of eternal damnation. When Dante's Divine Comedy consigned several popes to the inferno, or when medieval painters of the Last Judgment made sure to place one tiara sporting pontiff in the flames of hell, they were making a theological point about the nature and limits of the papal office, and that the, the point that the Pope's personal sanctity was irrelevant to the Church's central theological claims. And that's still the official teaching of the Church, but it's not the implication one would draw from the way that the papacy is, and there's no other real word for it, marketed today, the way each pope is treated not just as the supreme governor of the church, but as its singular embodiment, the Catholic answer to Gandhi or Mandela, the Beatles or the Stones. And with this marketing comes both outsized expectations and outsized vulnerability. Just as in American politics, the president is handled, handed both blame and credit for events that are outside one man's control, so too the pope tends to be idolized by ultramontanists and cursed by anti-Catholics and held responsible for good harvests and drowning floods alike. And as with the American presidency, these um, expectations have encouraged an ongoing centralization. If you're going to be blamed for everything that goes wrong, wouldn't you seek more power and control? And as in American politics, neither the church's conservatives nor its liberals have offered consistent resistance to papal aggrandizement. Everyone wants a humbler papacy, right up until their man sits the papal throne. <laughs> and as in American politics, the centralization of power has not always led to its effective use. Instead, in the years of Benedict XVI especially, the sheer incompetence of the Vatican became the one issue on which the church's feuding theological factions tended to wholeheartedly agree. But here a little charity is in order because of the central dilemma facing the modern papacy, which is the, that the Catholic Church has grown much larger and much weaker at the same time. There are many more Catholics than ever before, but the Church's influence over secular politics has ebbed almost everywhere since the 1960s, and consumer capitalism rather than the Church sets the cultural agenda for many of those baptized millions. There are many more Catholics, but in the developed world they're increasingly secularized, 
and outside the West, they're often just a generation or two removed from conversion from some kind of animism. With a few exceptions, like the Philippines and Poland, the deeply enculturated and ethnically rooted Catholicism that was the norm for generations has all but disapp disappeared, and with it, the church's easy, natural hold over its communicants. There are many more Catholics, but on every continent and country, and across continents and countries, with the difference between Africa and Europe, between Western Europe and Eastern Europe, between North America and Asia and so on, they find themselves divided against one another, standing on either side of a widening theological and moral gulf, arguably as wide or wider as the chasm that separated Catholicism from Orthodoxy and later from Lutheranism and Calvinism. This gulf exists because of Christianity's complicated relationship with liberal modernity which is both a rebellious daughter of the Christian faith and a rival and essentially dominant worldview. Every major Western religion, every faith tradition has spent decades and centuries wrestling with how far to accommodate to modernity and where and when to resist. The lines have been drawn over scriptural interpretation and historical criticism, over Darwin's theory of evolution, over church-state separation and race and eugenics and human equality and liturgy, the role of women, the nature of marriage, over clothing and music and entertainment, the importance of missionary work, and in our own time, over the sexual revolution and all its works. And in each case, religious traditions that share a common theological patrimony have ended up deeply divided internally. The specific controversies vary with the denom denomination, but there's an essential commonality to what separates liberal Episcopalians from conservative Anglicans, liberal Lutherans from conservative Lutherans, the same with Presbyterians, and so on through the list of Protestant denominations. And in, in each case, disagreements over how far a faith can go to accommodate modernity are the defining lines of division. And they've often grown so deep and bitter that fellowship and communion are imperiled and liberal and conservative believers have either grown apart or gone their separate ways. And in many cases, this division has been accelerated by the way that globalization has brought very different metaphysical landscapes in contact with, an, with one another and in then intention. The differences between America and Europe and Africa and Asia have hardened and accentuated the theological differences between, say, United Methodists or Episcopalians in the U.S. and their co-religionists in the developing world. Yet Roman Catholicism, which is more international even than any other Protestant denomination, and seemingly less well-suited to containing doctrinal contradictions than, say, the Anglican Communion, which was basically invented <laughs> to contain doctrinal contradictions, remains officially undivided. There have been small splinterings, yes. There were, uh, after the First Vatican Council, some liberal Catholics in Germany departed for what they called the Old Catholic Church. After the Second Vatican Council, you had the traditionalists in the Society of St. Pius X go into a kind of quasi-pseudo, we don't know, know whether we're really calling it a schism. Um, but there's nothing, been nothing sweeping or permanent, nothing to rival the Reformation or the break with orthodoxy, and nothing even as substantial as some of the schisms in Protestant denominations. Instead, Catholicism has found a way to contain multitudes, to straddle various liberal and conservative and modernist traditionalist divides with a su superficial similarity in formal commitments masking deep difference in fundamental beliefs. And these differences burn hot with controversy when they touch on sexuality and gender and bioethics, but what lie beneath are often larger and more comprehensive disagreements about the purpose of the church, the authority of the Bible, the nature of the sacraments, the definition of sin, the means of redemption, the true identity of Jesus, the very nature of God. And thus, the, this sort of this combination explains why contemporary Catholicism presents a kind of strange Janus face to the contemporary world. Viewed from afar, it can look like the most antique of institutions, the last pre-modern bulwark in an otherwise post-modern world, a strange ark from the Middle Ages still afloat in the 21st century's squalls. But then viewed from the inside, from a more intimate angle, it can seem more liberalized, more modernized and permissive than, say, many evangelical churches that once damned Rome as a foe of human liberty and progress. But that depends on where you look. If you look in other areas, it can appear as conservative or traditional, as its public image would suggest. And these tensions and contradictions are hardly a new problem for the church. 
Uh, prior to the 1960s, long before the sexual revolution, popes tried to suppress liberalizing tendencies, launching internal purges and imposing theological loyalty oaths. And then in the 60s and 70s, during Vatican II and afterwards, the pope shifted to a strategy of sort of modified limited hangout, you might say, which embraced certain aspects of the modern liberal consensus and encouraged various grassroots experiments that pushed things further. And then under John Paul and Benedict, you had a kind of reigning in that succeeded in holding the church together without in any way resolving the deep tensions between its factions. And how they might re be resolved is a very difficult question to answer. The Pope, given his powers and prominence, might seem like the man to answer it, but he doesn't just preside over Catholicism's contradictions, he's imprisoned by them. A conservative Pope, as we saw under John Paul and Benedict, can prod, he can exhort, he can reprimand or silence the occasional dissident theologian, but he can't actually suppress theological liberalism without breaking the church apart. And indeed, even that dire breaking apart scenario is hard to imagine because papal authority is channeled through structures that make such a purge nearly impossible to execute. The layers of Catholic bureaucracy are no less theologically divided than the wider church. In an anecdote often repeated by his conservative admirers, an ally lamented to Benedict XVI how little of the church reflected the pontiff's intentions and agenda, at which point the former Joseph Ratzinger supposedly gestured to his office door and said, my power ends there. I'm not going to give you my Teutonic accent because it's very bad. <laughs> but it isn't only a conservative pope who's frustrated by the system. A liberal pope, once a hypothetical, but I think no longer, has the same dilemmas and faces the same dangers. But with this added wrinkle, many of the changes that liberal Catholics might want a pontiff on their side to institute threaten to dynamite the very theological authority required to implement them because that authority depends not only on the papacy's aura and antiquity, but on its claim to, tra to transmit the Catholic faith intact rather than making sharp and controversial breaks. So procedurally, papal powers can look near absolute, but substantively, the Pope is supposed to have no power to change Catholic doctrine in areas where it's long established and defined. The 19th century definition of papal infallibility, the claim that a pope cannot err if he teaches authoritatively on faith and morals, has, if anything, tended to restrain papal experimentation even further. I'm only infallible if I speak infallibly, and I shall never do that, John XXIII is reported to have said. At the Second Vatican Council, popes were incredibly careful to build overwhelming consensus for the most controversial reforms the ones that lay in gray areas between unchanging and self-contradiction. The conciliar pronouncements, the pronouncements of Vatican II that seem most like developments in doctrine on religious liberty and the church's relationship with Judaism ended up passing with fewer than 100 dissenting votes out of more than 2,300 cast. And in the years since, even when they were clearly reaffirming long-standing church teaching on controversial issues, Paul VI, John Paul, and Benedict were all always careful to leave a certain ambiguity about whether infallibility had really been invoked. And this caution reflects the core reality, obscured by papalatry and papophobia alike, that popes have rarely been the great protagonists of Catholic dramas. For good or ill, they tend to move last after crises have percolated, after arguments have been thrashed away at for many years or lifespans. Circumscribed by tradition, hemmed in by bureaucracy, fearful that any too sudden move might undo their authority, they lack real power commensurate to their prominence, and never more so than our own age of papal celebrity and Catholic civil war. But what happens when a pope sets out to defy this reality, to slip through the bars and evade the constraints, to act in a way that a watching world, and above all perhaps a watching media, seems to want the man at the center of the earthly church to act? What happens when a pope decides he can deal with the church's crisis, its deep divisions, in a swift reforming march? What happens when a pope decides to change the church? So that's basically a condensed version of chapter one of the book, an attempt to set the stage for all of the interesting things that have happened in the Francis pontificate. And what is most interesting in certain ways is that those interesting things, the attempt that I gestured at at the end at a swift reforming march, are not at all the things that most of the cardinals who voted for the former Jorge Bergoglio expected from his pontificate. Um, this was a pontificate in which the cardinals elected a man who was considered a sort of 
austere and somewhat distant figure, um, a little bit grouchy, in fact, during his time as a cardinal archbishop in Buenos Aires. Uh, and they, they elected him because of he, you know, he had a reputation that you've seen play out as pope for personal austerity, um, for a close connection to the poor, and so on. Uh, but he was brought in with a very specific agenda, a, a reform agenda very specific to the Vatican itself. Um, there was a sense that you had had this long period of Catholic culture war, that you'd had two popes who had spent a lot of time sort of engaging in clear definitions of Catholic teaching that were often sort of set against both liberalizing trends in the church and sort of a general cultural spirit in the West. And over the same period, Rome itself had become more and more ungovernable, more likely to sabotage um, the popes, sabotage their communication strategy, um, sabotage uh, the basic morals of the church itself when it came to the handling of the sex abuse crisis and so on. And the idea was that Bergoglio turned Francis was there to be a kind of one-man cleanup crew. Um, and this has not really happened. Um, the pope, as pope, has taken a very personalized and sort of exhortatory approach to internal Vatican corruption. Um, there have been some high-profile firings and high-profile reshufflings and so on, and there's been a lot of sort of um, what you might call exemplary leadership in which the Pope himself attempts to sort of set a kind of example of personal austerity that then um, the wider Roman Curia and the government of the church is supposed to imitate, and there are sort of frequent tongue lashings, especially at the annual, um, the annual talk to the Roman Curia in which the Pope lists the various sins um, that people who work for the highest levels of the church are guilty of. But the actual plans to sort of restructure, um, restructure the Vatican bureaucracy, to reform the Vatican's finances, to at least attempt to make the, church, the church's central government something less of a Renaissance court and something more like the smooth-running, efficient machine that we all know and love in Washington, D.C., um, have, have mostly not gone very far at all. And you have, you know, when I talk to people who are uh, a little more admiring and a little less critical of Pope Francis than perhaps I am, even they tend to joke a little bit about the kind of next year, next year, have another cappuccino spirit uh, that prevails in Roman discussions of that sort of reform. Instead, Francis has been a very different kind of figure. Um, he's been a figure who has leaned in to that element of celebrity that I described um, in, in the chapter that I, just, um, that, I, that I just edited and read for you, um, who has sort of, you know, in ways that startled people who knew him in Argentina, who thought of him as someone who never gave interviews to the media, you know, who, didn't, who, didn't, who liked to do things, do good works, but do them privately, not letting your right hand know what your left hand are doing, and so on. Instead, obviously, there's been some kind of uh, at least superficial personal transformation um, occasioned by Francis's elevation to the papacy, in which he has become delighted to interact with the media at great length on long papal flights and say many, many interesting things. Um, he has, you know, obviously takes great delight in diving into crowds, and he has displayed a frankly brilliant talent for a kind of public imitation of Christ, the sort of crafting of what you might call a papal iconography, um, the images of him washing feet and embracing disfigured people and generally sort of modeling a vision of the New Testament with, instead of the figure of Jesus, the figure in papal white. And that aspect of his papacy has been, I think it's fair to say, a remarkable and unexpected success. Um, John Paul II, of course, had a similar celebrity air about him, a similar gift for sort of reading the media, read, you know, sort of crafting narratives and images and iconography and so on. Um, but John Paul II came in at a rather different moment. Uh, for the church. Francis came in at the end of a decade's worth of sex abuse uh, revelations, most of them horrific. He came in after a, a long period of, you know, the, I mean, a long period of, a long slog of culture war, you might say, in which Western secularization had advanced further, media hostility to institutional Christianity was stronger, and there were lots of reasons to say that you couldn't have a John Paul II again. You couldn't have this kind of celebrity figure who captured the imagination of our uh, scoffing, doubtful media. And that was all wrong. And Francis proved it wrong. And he demonstrated, I think, in a kind of swift march that, this, that, that 
a the right figure could exploit the celebrity side of the papacy to the hilt and in effect remind the skeptical media and the even more skeptical internet culture of kind of Christian or Christianish impulses that they didn't even remember that they had. Um, so that is sort of one half of the Francis agenda. Um, or maybe you could say, yeah, one half or one third. I can argue about it in my head. Um, but, but, but that has been by far the most successful. Um, and then the second, I'll just call it the second half because I think you can unite it. The second half has been a kind of reframing of the church's, of the, the church's public mission. And at the beginning, for let's say the first year or so of the pontificate, it looked like that reframing would basically take the, place of a, take the form of a big change of emphasis, um, which was not always as big a change of emphasis as the media wanted to think, right? If Francis came in and said, we're going to talk more about the poor than we are about sex. That's sort of the, you know, the, cr the crudest possible way of putting it. Um, and I think that really was the strategic vision. And of course, the church had always talked a great deal about the poor, and it had talked about the environment, and it, you know, it had talked about a thousand different issues besides um, what sort of the pelvic and bioethical issues that consume so much Western interest and debate. Uh, but for various reasons, all of that, it, it was hard for all of that to get a hearing. And so, and Francis seemed to have decided to make that side of the conversation much more overt and to sort of explicitly say, as his predecessors explicitly did not, that maybe the church is talking too much about sex. Everyone know, or everyone knows we're pro-life. Everyone knows what the church says about same-sex marriage. I don't need to say that all the time. I want to talk about the poor. Um, and that reframing, I think, had in certain ways the potential also to be as um, as successful as the kind of general exploitation of celebrity because it at least promised an attempt to sort of move the church towards the kind of synthesis that had, I think, and that has eluded Catholicism ever since the Second Vatican Council. Um, that basically if Francis could preserve and reassure, uh, could sort of preserve for and reassure conservative Catholics that the church's core teachings were not about to be changed, that the church was not going to suddenly just make a sweeping truce with the sexual revolution and become sort of a Catholic equivalent of where the Episcopal Church in the United States has ended up. If he could offer that reassurance while also seeming to successfully broaden the church's message to make it seem more capacious, to make the church's critique of the entire way the Western world works bring together the way we spend money, um, you know, and the, 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 way, the, way, we, the way we build and, tr and treat our environments and everything else, to sort of unify that as prior popes had tried unsuccessfully to do with the Catholic view on sex and marriage and family, then you would have the potential for the most successful pontificate of modern times. Um, but instead, Francis made, um, and I think continues to make, a different choice, uh, which is to, to take that initial change of emphasis one step further and actively seek an explicit truce um, with the sexual revolution. And I don't want to rattle on about this endlessly. I'll try and condense this to a sort of sharp point, and then we can move into a discussion and Q&A. But basically, starting about a year into his pontificate, Francis essentially turned a big part of his agenda um, over to the demands of Ger the German Catholic, a big part of the German Catholic hierarchy, a long-standing demand for the church to consider opening communion to divorced and remarried Catholics who had not received annulments. Um, and this, this, became, this question became the big topic of debate at two consecutive synods on the family, um, and it became a place where Francis ended up meeting a great deal of conservative resistance um, from various bishops and cardinals um, across two very contentious meetings in Rome. Um, and it, is, it ended basically with Francis offering a kind of ambiguous permission slip in the form of a footnote to an extremely long papal document that has subsequently been, been interpreted, I think, quite reasonably by the German bishops and by many more liberal Catholic countries, diocese bishops and so on, as a permission to effectively say the following, that the church still has a teaching about the indissolubility of marriage and that teaching exists somewhere up here as an ideal. 
um, and then, but then in pastoral reality, that teaching doesn't match the facts on the ground, and therefore on a case-by-case -case basis, the teaching can be tacitly suspended. Um, and that combination doesn't go as far as what the more liberal wing of the church was seeking at, at these synods, which was a more very, a more very explicit path um, back to communion that could be for the divorced and remarried that could be sort of simply implemented on the same basis um, across different parts of Catholicism. Instead, this more ambiguous approach implies a kind of doctrinal decentralization where, you know, basically your teaching on marriage is what your local bishop says it is and the church at the center is a little bit, the church in Rome is a bit more agnostic. Um, but generally the promise of this distinction, this sort of pastoral versus ideal distinction, uh, is that it promises a kind of truce between the church and, the, and sort of the culture of the developed world on a whole range of vexing social questions, most of them having to do with sex, but extending into wider issues of bioethics, physician-assisted suicide, and so on. Um, it enables the church, in, in the best case to scenario, to kind of have its cake and eat it too, to say, look, you know, of course, we can't change any of these doctrines, the Pope can't break with his predecessors who made very explicit statements on these questions, but if we sort of separate doctrine and pastoral practice, um, we can eliminate this huge tension that nobody knows what to do about, and that nobody includes myself, I would say, between what you might call contemporary bourgeois culture um, and New Testament sexual ethics. And if you make a wide enough pastoral doctrinal division, that tension can simply go away. And that's the best case um, scenario, I think, and it's the vision that Francis has in mind. Um, my critique of it, which is of course not unique to me, and I'm not incredibly well qualified to make it being just a newspaper columnist, but I take heart in that it's made by people with considerably more impressive theological credentials as well. Um, the, the critique is that this move, that in practical terms, it amounts to a kind of permission slip for further division that all of the complicated divisions of a billion member church that were already there are sort of prevented from leading inexorably to splits and schism by the presence of a, a actual doctrinal center in the Roman church, that the point of, ha of the pope, the point of the bishop of Rome is to provide that center. And the church can survive having the teaching in the center not map precisely accurately onto the way individual Catholic dioceses and parishes and so on operate. Um, the church can survive a division between, um, between its teaching and the practice on the ground, but for the teaching itself to, that, to offer permission slips for further change on the ground points the more liberal parts of Catholicism inexorably towards a kind of Protestantization and provokes, and I think you can see this, and it, it, could, be, it could be exaggerated by who I read and where I go, but I think you can see this among conservative Catholics, that this permission slip inclines the conservative wing of the church towards a kind of greater and greater traditionalism, a sense that, well, if Vatican II and the compromises the church already made with the modern world led us to this point where the Pope is sort of essentially turning, turning Jesus' teaching into this distant ideal, then perhaps all of those compromises were a mistake and the church should essentially reconsider its, its sort of attempted marriage with the modern world. So you have, I think, in this, in this strategy of doctrinal decentralization, the seeds of um, different parts of Catholicism developing further and further away from one another in ways that become harder and harder over the long run for Rome to hold together. That's the practical critique. Um, I guess what you, called the, what you might call the principled critique is that this is all a bit bogus, right? Um, that there is an element of kind of um, late Soviet Union um, rhetoric about, uh, about turning teachings that, are, that have already, in various ways, been compromised. I mean, the Catholic Church's annulment process in the United States is quite generous and tries to err on the side of mercy, and most annulments that are applied for are granted, and there's already a sense among many people that there's a sort of, the annulment process is an is a annoyance, but ultimately a formality, and so on. The Church has already made a series of these kind of compromises, and to reach a point where the idea of marital indissolubility becomes purely ideal, pure, a purely abstract teaching to which no 
ordinary Catholic um, is is sort of required required to hold and follow ultimately if things go wrong is to dissolve the teaching entirely. And it's very hard to um, sustain a church that is supposed to be, you know, founded by Jesus Christ himself and contain the most important truths about our existence if the way that you are sort of connecting yourself to those hard truths um, is similar to the way communist parties in their later stages of decay connected themselves to the words of Chairman Mao and Marx and Lenin. And since I believe that Catholicism is true, whereas communism was uh, damnably false, um, um, I, I, I think that taking the church in that kind of direction is the gravest of mistakes and um, a very risky gamble for a man charged with a difficult, constrained, burdensome, challenging, but extremely important office, perhaps the most important office in the world. So that's what I have to say, and I would love to hear what you have to say. And we have a microphone here. Thank you. So we, ha we, have, we have two microphones, and since uh, the bookstore is recording this talk to give to the Swiss Guard um, so that I can be arrested <laughs> later, um, please speak into the microphone, at least raise your voice at the end so it sounds like a question. Um, <laughs> I accept all manner of abuse as long as you raise your voice at the end. So, All right. Um, all right. Thank you very much, Mr. Doubt, that it's wonderful to hear from you, and uh, I'm looking forward to reading your book. I uh, haven't gotten to it yet, but... Uh, one question that came to mind, um, especially in light of the outcry from more conservatives, particularly lit liturgical conservatives, about the youth synod and their lack of representation in their statement, do you think that the liberal wing, the conservative wing, or both overestimate how many of them there are in the church at large? Because <laughs> I know a lot of more traditionally inclined people, and I feel that they often overestimate their support yes. uh, by quite, quite a bit, but I, I feel like both sides may be doing that. So I'd like your thoughts on that. Yes, that's, that's a very good question. Um, I'm going to semi-repeat it just, just in case. The, the question is basically whether both sides of this internal Catholic controversy I'm describing are perhaps overestimating their actual grassroots support. Um, and with a particular reference to uh, there's a, the next synod in Rome is a synod on the youth uh, and so there was just this big squabble over the document that a group of young people put together because a lot of traditionalists um, felt that it was not, it didn't have enough to say about the traditional Latin mass um, and, and other aspects of traditional liturgy. Um, and so, so the answer to your question is yes. I, I think both sides are overestimating, in a sense, how much... Um, what you might call normie Catholics, for want of a better word, um, ha have time to sort of think and argue about questions that, you know, in the particular case of communion for the divorced and remarried can get very technical and abstract. And, you know, once you start talking about the difference between, you know, this kind of annulment procedure and that one and so on, um, you're sort of into, into sort of um, high-level theological territory that, is not something that sort of maps up onto the way that most people experience religious practice. Um, and I mean, I think one of the best counter arguments to part of the argument I make in this book, which basically says, look, the controversies of the Francis era are a really big deal, and people will be studying these arguments between cardinals and popes and so on uh, many hundreds of years into the future. The best counter argument is that, well, if you go into an ordinary Catholic parish and you say, what do you think of the footnote in Amoris Laetitia? <laughs> you're not, you're not going to get people jumping up in the pews and saying, I'm leaving. That's it. I'm, I'm swimming the Bosporus and going to orthodoxy. Um, and there's, no, there's nothing quite, there, I think there's a certain amount of unsettlement and argument occasioned by this pontificate, but it obviously hasn't created the kind of dramatic shifts in everyday Catholic practice that happened in the aftermath of Vatican II, right? We're, we're at nowhere near the level of sort of what you might call um, parish by parish conflict and disarray that you would have had in different parts of the church in the, in the late 60s and, and early 1970s. Um, and that's an important point for everybody involved in these debates to keep in mind, and I think it applies to both sides, that, you know, liberals overestimate how many Catholics are desperate for these kind of changes. There's, a, I think there's a long-standing liberal tendency to assume that 
the reason the church is an institutional decline is that we haven't changed our teachings in these ways. If we change our teaching in these ways, we can arrest the institutional decline. That hasn't been borne out by um, the experience of mainline Protestantism. Um, there's little evidence so far that it's true for Catholicism in the Francis era. There's lots of anecdotes, um, including people I know well about people returning to church because of Francis's influence, but none of it shows up in the overall data. Um, but at the same time, you know, conservatives, and this was especially true under John Paul II and Benedict when the conservative wing was in charge of the church, they just, yeah, they overestimate how many people are willing to, you know, are, are sort of look at Catholicism and care that much about, you know, this doctrinal continuity, right? This stuff that, you know, when you write for a living and you're a newspaper columnist and you want to write about intellectual argument seems very important. But yeah, in the lived reality of ordinary Catholic life um, seems less so when you're just trying to get your kids to mass on Sunday on time, which is a particular challenge. Um, so I think... At the same time, the nature of any large institution is that elites ultimately set the tone in ways that don't necessarily change things overnight for people in the pews, but have a kind of cascading effect. And this is particularly true for a church like the Catholic Church that has a sort of clerical caste, right? I mean, at go the Catholic Church is run by, by people who take religious vows. It's run by a sort of selected celibate um, cadre. And, you know, and I mean, one of the points that conservatives made when they wanted to pat themselves on the back and feel good about the future under John Paul and Benedict was, you know, all the young priests are conservative and therefore the future belongs to conservative Catholicism. And, and that was overstated, but there was a, a certain real truth to it, right? That, that, you know, that the people who run parishes, the people who sort of decide you know, what kind of, you know, the particular way the Catholic liturgy is going to be employed Sunday after Sunday, the people who, you know, bring certain things back into the Mass or, you know, decide if you're going to have Eucharistic adoration, or, you know, decide which parish groups get funding and so on. Those people do have a lot of power to shape the future of Catholicism, and those people are in turn shaped in all kinds of ways by the decisions that are, that are made at the top. And the same is true just sort of generally of this kind of the sort of permissional approach that I'm that I'm describing, where you have sort of more space for different parts of Catholicism to sort of fulfill their various destinies, right? That doesn't change things on the ground tomorrow or the next day, but over 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and so on, it determines where German Catholicism goes, probably. It determines where different parts of the church in America go. And what you're describing, this, this little battle over the youth synod, I think is, you know, again, it's just a few hundred people plus a few couple thousand people fighting online. Um, but those are the kind of people who are going to be, um, you know, sort of run, you know, most active in parishes, most active, most likely to, you know, join religious orders, most likely to, you know, go up to their priest and complain about the liturgy in various ways as Catholics do like to do. And all of that has an impact. And the fact that in that case, you had this sort of this, this sort of intense group of traditionalists who kind of freaked everybody else out, involved out, I think is itself a signifier of sort of where these debates are going, that sort of a more liberal pope can almost paradoxically, you know, disempower conservatives, but that means empowering traditionalists. And that you know, in turn creates more pressure on cath traditional Catholicism to go this way, even as, let's say, German Catholicism has more and more pressure to Protestantize, to say, well, we don't have enough priests, so we need lay-run parishes. You know, we don't have enough parishioners, so we need to find a way to welcome Lutherans and so on, combined with Lutheran parishes. Like, all of these pressures are long-term, but they can be exacerbated in various ways by the decisions made at the top. That was a very long-winded answer, but hopefully somewhat interesting. Sir? Yeah, so you talk sort of about this ultra-Montanistic celebrity surrounding the Holy Father, but for the first time since Celestine V, we have both a Holy Father and a Holy Father Emeritus. Uh, so how does that affect this, you know, cult of celebrity, especially giving, given the letter gate a couple months back where, one, where for those who don't know, a Please. letter that Pope Benedict XVI <laughs> Uh, wrote upon the release of uh, a series of volumes on Francis's theology, 
was edited so that the last two paragraphs were left out, including a, including a paragraph critical of one of the writers of a volume. So, and whenever it came out, this was obviously quite a big scandal because so many of the more conservatives uh, were like, "Oh, guess only the liberal theologian, the, guess the liberal theologians only like the Pope when they've got one of theirs." Um, it's exciting times in the church. It, <laughs> we're doing a lot of fun things in Rome these days. Yeah, but what happens to sort of this ultra Montanistic celebrity when we have both the Pope? but also this elder statesman figure like Benedict who pops into the public spotlight every now and then whether he wants to. Yeah, um, that's a very good question. The question is about um, what basically what happens to this celebrity I've talked about in a kind of year, you know, not just year, but decade of two popes scenario like we have right now. Um, my sense based on Francis's uh, experience to date is it doesn't necessarily affect the celebrity um, that my my view when Benedict resigned was that it would have a kind of demystifying effect on the office that with especially over time if it becomes an expectation basically that popes resign that that creates a kind of shift towards more of a CEO model and less of a kind of paternal model um, for the church and I say that sort of with full understanding of all of the reasons that Benedict wanted to resign and um, you know I can't even begin to imagine what it would be like to be in that office um, at, at his age, but it, it still felt like sort of a step away from, yeah, the sort of mystical element of the papacy, the extent to which it's this incredibly powerful office that involves literally laying down your life. Um, with that shift, you could imagine that affecting the celebrity quotient because, you know, celebrity thrives a little bit on mysticism, probably. Uh, but Francis has showed that it, I, I, I don't think it's had that effect yet. And certainly you can see in the, in the secular world that, you know, the possibility that Steve Jobs could resign did not minimize his celebrity while he was running Apple. So there's no necessary reason why being a CEO and being a celebrity are incompatible. Um, I think the, you know, the sort of the controversies over, over different ways that Francis's people have been seen as manipulating Benedict's message or ways that Benedict has been seen as intervening to undermine Francis and so on are pretty good sort of ordinary prosaic reasons not to have two popes. It's a very strange and bizarre thing. Um, and, you know, the sort of the conspiracy theories that have inevitably sprouted as Benedict, as Francis has seemed to reverse teachings or tweak teachings and so on that Benedict offered, that's, again, a sort of inevitably negative downside of having two popes. I will say I've actually been a little surprised, given that this is the first time that we have a Pope Emeritus and that there's this sort of obvious glaring tension between where Francis seems to want to go and where John Paul and Benedict were, that there isn't more conspiracy theorizing. Um, this, I guess, is sort of connected to my surprise that the Trump presidency hasn't actually led to every American city burning down in a, you know, a, fur a, fur a furious, a furious uh, violence. It may be that all of that is now redirected into Twitter. Um, and so, so, you know, the, the Catholicism will hold together because people will only feud in virtual space. But I, I've been, I think, yeah, I guess my underlying point is just that having two popes creates all kinds of new and distinctive problems, and it might almost be impressive, given all the controversies around this pontificate, that um, set of vacantism, you know, the, the, this, these sort of obscure ideas about popes being illegitimate or papal elections being nullified and so on, haven't gained more ground among conservative and traditional Catholics. Sir. Uh, thanks for being here. I've been appreciating your commentary uh, for a long time. Thank you. Uh, uh, a question of doct for seeking doctrinal clarity as well as just a, a broader question. On doctrinal clarity, is it divorce or remarriage that yes. makes a Catholic ineligible for communion? And on the broader question of elites setting the tone, is that really true when, for example, in birth control, the, I don't know if the vast majority, certainly the majority of American Catholics have been ignoring that for generations? Yep. So, um, so so to the first two, two questions, one about the, the latter about um, whether elites really have that much influence given uh, how few American Catholics and Catholics generally practice, uh, practice birth control, or I mean practice, use natural family planning as opposed to artificial contraception. Then the first question, the point of clarification, um, so it is, it is remarriage not divorce um, that precludes receiving communion. Uh, and 
the although the the church historically has been you know pretty harsh on divorce in all kinds of ways the official view is that you know divorce is acceptable when it's necessary um but it's the the, the issue is basically just that the church considers you know, it basically says you can have only one real marriage in your lifetime unless your spouse dies. Um, and, um, and, you know, in the early church, there were some controversies about whether you could have a second marriage even after your spouse died. Um, but uh, you can have only one real marriage, and therefore, if you cannot obtain an annulment saying that your first marriage was not, you know, not real, void in some way, um, then you're in a state of public adultery if you, if you are married again. And as long as that's the case, you can't receive communion, both because it's an act of sort of public contradiction of the church's teaching, and also because, um, in effect, you need to be protected from committing sacrilege. And the church, the church also says, look, you know, we don't know who's in mortal sin and who's not. We don't know, you know, the extenuating circumstances and all the complexities. Um, but we, you know, it, we have to assume if you are you know, living with someone who's not, who's not your actual husband per the church's wife, lights or your actual wife, um, that you're committing adultery. And if you're committing adultery, taking communion, you know, you, if you're committing, if it's ongoing adultery, you can't just confess it because it's ongoing. You don't intend to stop. And if you don't intend to stop, then you aren't supposed to take communion because that's sacrilege. So that's the sort of, but as, as I said in response to the first question, the, the argument gets very technical um, very quickly, uh, even though, of course, for people in these actual circumstances, it's very raw and personal as well. Um, so it's a it's a strange combination, I think, of this these sort of technical definitions and then, you know, the sort of raw stuff of people's intimate lives, which in our society is very often very raw indeed. Um, to the second point about elites, yes, you know, if if there is a wide enough gap between, uh, you know. If there's a wide enough gap between cultural practice and what the elite are trying to teach or advance, then you know, then then there's a clear limit on how far that elite can actually get in terms of shaping everyday Catholic practice and belief. Um, at the same time, there is you know what what conservative Catholicism under John Paul and Benedict did was basically sustain a kind of you know a kind of conservative church within the church that does, you know, practice natural family planning, does try to, you know, follow all the church's teachings around marriage and sexu sexuality. Um, so it did have that effect, um, but that effect was concentrated among, I'd say, about 25 to 30 percent of regular churchgoers. That's my guesstimate. You know, the statistics vary and there's a million different ways to slice it, but basically about you know, it's about 10 or 15 percent of self-identified Catholics who try and practice natural family planning, and then that nets out to a bigger chunk, but still not a majority at all, of churchgoers. Um, but, but, but yes, I mean, there are, I mean, I think, and this is, again, goes back to the first question, there are, there are hard limits, seemingly, in the Western world on what either liberal reformers or conservatives can sort of do about this tension that we have between sort of how we live and what the New Testament says. And the liberal response has not netted, you know, new evangelization and growth. I think the conservative response has essentially um, prevented dissolution without either, without creating new growth necessarily either. And so that's why we keep having this debate over and over and over again. Ma'am. Hi. Um, I am not a Catholic, so this will not be a doctrinal question. <laughs> um, I, can, I accept all questions. <laughs> okay. I consider myself a Jewish Unitarian, so that should tell you something. A proud member of the New York Times reading base. <laughs> and um, I read you from time to time and found, find you often illuminating, iconoclastic, interesting, and you're somebody that I keep on saying to my liberal friends, you ought to read him from time to time. Very kind. <laughs> so um, <laughs> They might be slightly disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes I am disappointed, but sometimes I'm, I'm like... <laughs> and so this is one of the times, because um, I, given your iconoclasm, given your ability to see things in new and different ways, your embrace of doctrinal... 
documents thinking mm -hmm. is, is surprising to me in, in the intensity of your embrace. And I'm, I'm wondering if you think that, um, I imagine, I haven't read, but I imagine you're a constitutionalist, a, um, not entirely, um, but using the American Constitution as something mm -hmm. as a foundational document that you might agree that um, African Americans, they're not three fifths of a person, and et cetera. There's many things in there that you would say are not in keeping with the America, right. the, the basic ethics of the American experiment. But America was founded by Protestants. <laughs> <laughs> so similarly, there are many things in the in. Jesus' teachings that I wonder if Jesus were alive today, he might see differently given the same foundational ethic right. that he might say the world is a different place today. And I you know, could see how things would be shaped differently in doctrine. So I'm wondering what the embrace of doctrine actually serves when it doesn't serve the people in terms of kindness, social justice, all the things about Catholicism that I love, and particularly its embrace of male privilege that I find particularly deplorable. Well, let me, so that's a, um, I'm not even going to repeat it, I'm just going to start, I'm just going to start in. <clears throat> so let's start, let's start from the back to the beginning. Um, I, I, I actually think that if fr there is a version of the Francis Pontificate uh, where that was sort of similarly reforming and similarly gratifying to some liberal Catholics um, that I would have not had this kind of weird allergic reaction to. Um, and one of the things that that might have involved would have been shifts in the role of women in the church. I will say historically, I think that Catholicism has had a very impressive record um, given the different contexts, usually heavily patriarchal in which it's operated, um, of elevating and empowering women um, and, the, and that the, the sort of the tension between um, the all-male priesthood and our sort of post-feminist society is a tension of the last 50 years and if you go back deep into Catholic history it's all you know nuns founding weird communities and yelling at popes <laughs> for uh, you know moving to Avignon and, and things like that um, and you know the the roster of female saints in Catholicism is fairly impressive and, you know, it's filled with women who cut off their hair and rode off to save France from the English. Um, that's, that's the sort of his, right, yes, yes. Right, so, so uh, if, if Pope Francis had come in and said, look, you know, we're going to, um, you know, maintain the all-male sacramental priesthood, but we're going to, in our, as a big part of our Vatican reform, we're going to put nuns in charge of these 17 offices. We're going to consider, as he has considered, um, ordaining women to the diaconate, and, you know, we're going to even consider, um, you know, appointing a woman as a cardinal, right? All things that would give traditionalists in the church hives, um, I would have written, you know, uncertainly and skeptically maybe about some of those moves, but I could have been talked into them. Um, and I probably, I probably still could. It's the, it's the change, you know, because again, if you go back to the New Testament, Jesus's attitude towards women is fairly different from the broader patriarchal attitude of his time. And indeed, since we're here on Holy Saturday, we're, you know, we're in the midst of a portion of uh, the Christian liturgical calendar in which the focus is on how all the men ran away and, you know, the women were still there and they were, despite their inability to be legal witnesses at the time, they were the first witnesses to the resurrection and all the rest. So, um, I don't, I don't have a necessary problem with a Catholic church that learns something from sort of the experience of feminism and sort of the changes of the last 50 years. There are limits to what I think the church can learn from it, but I don't, the idea does not, I don't have a sort of necessary objection to it. Um, to me, the difference is, and I'm joking about the Protestants and the Constitution, but the fact is that I don't think that the Constitution was God's final revelation to humanity on earth. And I became a Catholic uh, because I thought there was a good chance that the New Testament was. And if the New Testament is, if you know, this, this sort of central revelation, and if Jesus of Nazareth is himself, um, you know, the the, the sort of an embodiment, the embodiment of 
of you know the second person of the Trinity, all, all the rest of that non-Unitarian stuff. Um, if that's true, a and if this same Jesus is, you know, you praised me for my very limited and modest iconoclasm in the pages of the New York Times, but Jesus is a very willing iconoclast, right? Jesus is very happy to come in and mess with gender norms and you know attack the rich and attack the the priestly the you know priestly caste and all the rest. Uh, if he has that kind of willingness, why does God in this revelation decide to have Jesus also set up these sort of more, more absolute, not less, more absolute teachings about what the nature of marriage is, um, what the human body is for, sex, and all the rest of it? Um, and, you know, I, I think if you take a kind of a sort of what we would call a low Christology, right? A view, a kind of semi-Aryan view of Jesus where his, his godliness is just sort of a piece of him that he gradually becomes aware of and so on. Then, you know, yeah, you can tell a story where there's big chunks of things that he gets wrong and so on. Um, and one of those might be sexuality and we've sort of come into a fuller conception of that. Um, but, I mean, I'm not, I'm not wildly impressed with the sexual world that we've built <laughs> since the 1960s. And my impression from talking to my feminist friends and acquaintances is that they're not wildly impressed either, even if they wouldn't want to put the Catholic Church back in charge. They're not wildly impressed. So first of all, I'm not sure that 50 years of experience and experimentation is enough to persuade me to sort of ditch a high Christology for a low Christology in order to convince myself that Jesus would have been fine with the world that gave us um, Hugh Hefner and Harvey Weinstein. Um, mm -hmm. And I also think, you know, there's, there's a sense in which it, it, it turns God into someone who doesn't play fair, right? God sends his only begotten son. He so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. And by the way, about this incredibly important aspect of human life, the way that we bond with each other and pair off and have children and rear them and so on, he told us a bunch of things that were cruel lies. Because that's, that's what it amounts to, right? You're saying that, because, you know, Jesus doesn't, I mean, if, if Jesus is wrong about this, he's really wrong. Um, in ways that imply sort of, you know, from a modern liberal perspective, the way the church enacts its teaching on these things is cruel. And if you think that, then it's not clear to me why you would invest so much faith in the idea of Jesus as, you know, direct, you know, direct from God, basically. It seems to me that, you know, if God thought that the sexual ethics of 2017, 2018 were closer to the truth than the sexual ethics embedded in the New Testament, he should have embedded our sexual ethics in the New Testament. And the fact that he didn't makes me inclined um, to prefer my iconoclasm against the current sexual order to an iconoclasm against the New Testament, if that, if that makes sense. Um, and look, you know, and I mean, look, I, I live in the world. I, I am not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very aware of all the cruel uses to which Christian sexual ethics can be put. Um, and I could be wrong, you know, and I try and try and be open-minded about that. But it's worth remembering that, you know, I'm up here as a conservative, right, defending the conservative positions of the church. But the conservative positions of the church in the New Testament are, I mean, these are radical ideas. The conservatives in the New Testament are the Jewish priests who say, well, the Mosaic law has all these rules about divorce. And Jesus is saying, no, you're sort of, that, that approach is not what God wanted. And the thing about Catholicism um, is that it's at its best, it's taken the most hard to believe things Jesus says. Marriage is for life. You've got to eat my body and blood. Some people have to be eunuchs for the kingdom of God. And it's tried to actually instantiate those across 2,000 years. And it's often failed and it's often, you know, <clears throat> had some unfortunate interludes and episodes. But that, that radicalism is part of what impresses me about the church. And to the extent that you see a radical sort of under my conservative shirt in the pages of the New York Times wrestling and trying to get out, that radical likes, it likes the weird, the weird but it likes the weird, you know, it likes the, the weird stuff in the New Testament and it wants the church to stay weird. <laughs> so. I'm um, afraid we only have time for probably two more questions. Okay, okay. so, sir. Hi, so, um, I, this was actually a great lead-in for mine. I, too, am a secular progressive Jew who's read you for years and always found you to be, even though we disagree on many core things, uh, 
fair-minded and provocative and interesting. So, uh, and uh, I know that one thing we definitely disagree on, um, and I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room who does, is, is abortion and Roe versus Wade and whether a woman has a right to choose. Uh, and uh, the reason I bring this up is because I know that um, your your former employer, The Atlantic, has just hired a conservative writer named Kevin Williamson. Uh, no, no, no. I want to ask the question. And your and your the current editor of The Atlantic was here. Oh, interesting. I think he's, I think he's disappeared. Oh, he's that's big, that's too to that's too bad. Because it's really that's a too bad. For well, him. well, no, no. But I, I have a question for you. So, um, and I know that your um, two of your colleagues just in the last forty eight hours at the New York Times, uh, Michelle. Goldberg and Brett Stevens have already weighed in on opposite sides of this. Um, now, Williamson has made a number of controversial statements, but the germane one here and the one which uh, narrow pro-choice America is circulating a petition about is uh, where he said that women who have abortions should be hanged. Um, and uh, not only narrow and, and I, I I, I infer your colleague Michelle Goldberg, but also many feminist writers like Jessica Valenti have basically called for him to be fired um, before he's written a column there. So my question's for you. I'm not going to ask you to weigh in on whether he should be fired directly. As you say, that's for the editor of The Atlantic. My questions for you are, number one, do you agree with Kevin Williamson that women who have abortions should be hanged or in any other way executed? Number two, how would you situate that in the context of Catholic doctrine as you understand it? And number three, do you consider those remarks appropriate and responsible for a mainstream conservative commentator, commentator such as yourself? Uh, and those are uh, Okay, so uh, thank you for your question and for your kind words about my supposed intellectual consistent. No, no, I, I'm not. I'm, I'm, and I'm being, I'm being sincere in return. Um, so the answer, I, I'll try and make this brief. This is another one where you could spiral out endlessly. Um, but no, I don't think that women who have abortion should, um, I, I do sort of mildly support capital punishment. Not that that matters necessarily, but it's worth sort of worth stating for the purposes of the conversation. But no, I don't think that women who have abortion should be tanged, guillotined, or otherwise executed. And in fact, um, in general, I don't. I would not support criminal penalties for women who obtain abortions under my ideal abortion regime. Um, and I that can, to, to the extent that the Catholic Church right now has a sort of position on that question. I, you know, there aren't like formal legal statements. That's also the Catholic Church's position. If you went up and asked a random pro-life Catholic archbishop what he thinks, you know, about this question, he would he would agree with me, I'm sure, and probably be even more vehement about it. Um, as to the consistency of that, sorry, um, we could be here a long time for that for that discussion. So we'll we'll but but they would they would agree. Bracket the capital punishment issue. They would agree that criminal penalties should. We should not be should not be applied. Now, the consistency. The point that that's then raised about that is, of course, you know, what, how can this be consistent if you think that abortion is intentional killing and murder, and you support, you know, if oh, if a woman killed her six-month-old child, you would have her put in jail and so on. Um, why don't you have the courage of your convictions to be um, the extremist that then we can, you know, petition to have fired? Um, and I, I think it's a, I think it's a complicated question and a totally reasonable question for the pro-choice or pro-abortion side to ask. Um, generally, my view is that it is the, the arguments, the, the pro-choice arguments for abortion are, are not strong arguments for abortion itself, um, but the issues that they emphasize, um, the existence of some kind of right to privacy, which I think, you know, independent of broader metaphysical questions about rights, I think is a reasonable, a reasonable thing for the state to assume um, the unique nature of pregnancy, the sort of the 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 extent to which an unwanted pregnancy is sort of experienced as a kind of burden and potentially internal threat in ways that no other human relationship is, um, the unknowability, uh, you know, independent of ultrasound technology and so on, of the developing human person. There's a whole long line of ways in which abortion is a unique kind of killing, um, a unique kind of murder, and that the woman who does it is in a position unlike any human being in relationship to any other human being. And the law historically in um, realms more, much more shaped by Christianity or Catholicism than ours in the, in the Western world at least has tended 
to recognize that fact. And if you go back to the American legal tradition uh, on abortion prior to Roe v. Wade, there was a strong, um, a strong assumption that you could prosecute abortion doctors, but you didn't prosecute women, that maybe the laws would be on the books, but they wouldn't be enforced. And the best, I don't have a perfect analogy for this in other areas, but the best one in part I can come up with is suicide, right? From, from a Catholic point of view, and again, I know our more secular culture has moved away from this conception, but from a Catholic point of view, suicide is a form of murder. It's, it's self-murder, but it's murder nonetheless. Um, um, but I don't, you know, I would not support treating someone who commits an attempted suicide as, um, I, I would not support jailing them uh, using the same laws that we use to prosecute other forms of attempted homicide, even though I think that on strict moral grounds, those acts are very similar. Um, and I think you can look at all of the psychological and other complexities around suicide and see a reasonable case for why, even when, again, we considered suicide something more like murder, even when you know a suicide wouldn't be buried in consecrated ground and so on, you wouldn't throw an attempted suicide in jail for five years. Um, it, you know, and I, I can't give you a perfect moral theory that explains why this makes sense, but I think there is a common sense intuitional theory um, and sort of the common experience of humanity that would reasonably justify a legal regime that restricts or forbids abortion but doesn't jail women for it. So that's long and short at the same time. Um, where, where lines should be drawn, um, I mean, my, I don't know Kevin personally beyond probably exchanged a couple of emails. Um, I'm a great admirer of his skill and force and intelligence as a writer. Um, and in general, I'm against sort of strong litmus tests, both left and right, for employment. I think magazines that want to have a diverse uh, group of writers, and I would extend this very easily to socialists and anarchists as well as, well as right-wingers, have to accept that you know, part of that diversity is that people will take extreme and strident and strange positions on certain issues. Kevin has not defended that view at length. It was a tweet. He had a couple follow-up tweets that seemed to suggest he was basically sort of saying, well, I'm you know, I don't know what I think about this. I want to be consistent. And then he simply let the issue drop. It's not something he's written on at length. And so my secondary view is that as someone who tweets and who has written probably a million words in my professional life, um, and this extends to some of the other sort of a couple of the racially charged things Kevin wrote, I think in our era, it is a very bad idea to decide hires and make judgments on the basis of plucking someone's most controversial tweet and using it to assume that you know exactly what their overall worldview architecture is. So that's sort of my partial, um, partial defense of Kevin writing for The Atlantic, a magazine where I used to work. Um, and was there any other part of the question? Okay, good, good. But th that's a very good and, and hard question. So thank you. Um, we have one, and then one, one last more question. question. I have to go to you. I'm sorry, sir. All right. I'm a Catholic moral theologian who teaches at the business at the Bishop's University. Oh, so, uh, you know, we have very <laughs> interesting backgrounds. <laughs> yeah. So I want to argue divorce and remarriage with you, but I will I will hold back. No, no. And uh, no, no, no. I really will hold back because we have well, time. You... Um, uh, and I want to ask you a different question. In the book, you're very positive about the Francis I papacy, finding a new Catholic center, missing Catholicism to opportunity, you say at one point. And I said nice things about you in a review, and now everyone on the Catholic left hates me. Which and, review Which review was it? Uh, in uh, For Catholic News Service. Oh, I haven't read it, okay. so I should. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, I, I wanted, I, I I wanted I, I to go, ask you, so yeah, I wanted to Do you to want me to tweet it, or is that no. bad? <laughs> that, I've been tweeting all, I've been trying to take a tweet all uh, reviews okay. policy, but I... I try to stay off Twitter. <laughs> okay, then I'll, I'll find it and tweet it, and then you'll be I'll in watch. trouble. Um, uh, my question is, where is the space in the church today for a new Catholic center to emerge in the uh, professional elite of the church? Because quite frankly, everyone's taking sides right now. You're either for Francis or you're right. traditionalist against Francis. Do you see spaces where some kind of center could reemerge? I mean, to the extent that there's a center that I, I can imagine going forward, um, it, the, the only center I see is a kind of union of the extremes, right? I, I think that there is a Catholic left and again, they are overrepresented on Twitter. Everything I'm about to say right. comes with the large footnote. 
overrepresented on Twitter. Um, but there is a Catholic left that likes the Francis Pontificate primarily or exclusively because of his message on sort of the economy, but that's really a crude way of saying it, his sort of message about like late modern commercial culture, the throwaway culture, sort of the disposable nature of modern Western life, the, you know, then more broadly the relationship between the rich world and the poor world and so on. That's what they care about. And to the extent, and maybe they're a little bit engaged in these Amoris Laetitia debates, but not really. And some of them are even secretly or not secretly on my side in them, right? And then on the Catholic right. Or secretly. They're, secret, they're some, secretly on your side. A few. That's what I'm here saying. and there. <laughs> here and there. I, I don't want to. Um, and, that, and then on the Catholic right, there is a sort of attempt among people who, in this <laughs> phenomenon I've tried to describe, have been sort of pushed tradition word by Francis's moves, there's a kind of attempted rediscovery of the church's critique of, you know, liberalism from back in the 19th century, which has taken some particularly weird forms in, <laughs> I don't want to really go down the rabbit hole, but the, the Mortara case and, yeah. the, you know, anyway, so that, and that, that there's, there's some, there's some stuff there that I have to come back and I'd write another book and get invited back and talk about it and we can really get into Jewish Catholic dialogue as well. Um, <laughs> But notwithstanding those weirdnesses, there is some real overlap between the left Catholic, slightly Marxist-informed critique of modernity and the right Catholic, uh, you know, 19th century Pope-informed critiques of liberal modernity. And some of these people are friendly with each other, and they have a more interesting dialogue than, frankly, I've seen from the sort of baseline, you know, neoliberal and neoconservative Catholic types over the last 30 or 40 years. So, so that's, if you want a case for some sort of new center, it's basically that as Western civilization collapses and breaks down completely, okay. and there's riots in the streets and cats and dogs living together and so on, the most radical forms of Catholics left and right um, will discover that they have a lot to talk about as they try and put put sort of the pieces of everything back together. Um, the pessimistic take is that there's, there's a, a less radical version of that that's just basically saying, you know, the church, the, the natural Catholic center is morally conservative and socially liberal to populist. And that's sort of where, you know, it, that sort of worked in the U.S. in like the context of the New Deal. It worked up until the sexual revolution. It can't map exactly onto our political debates, but like, you know, even someone like Donald Trump sort of gestures at it when he tries to combine, uh, you know, when he tries to combine being pro-life, or in his case, pro-life, and sort of having, having a more populist economics than re Republicans usually have. That's, in fact, in certain ways, what I see as the project that I have myself worked on a little bit in terms of American conservatism. We, I had that joking, eye-rolling reference to my book, Grand New Party, but the idea behind Grand New Party was basically that if the Republican Party became more populist, it could become effectively more Catholic and could be sort of pro-life and pro-family in a more thoroughgoing way than the Republican Party has been. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, that's where the less radical, everything's gonna collapse, um, possibility for a center still lies, but I think f the Francis era has made that sort of simpler center harder to reach for by, in effect, confirming a lot of conservative Catholics in their sense that any liberal Catholicism will just be liberalizing across the board, that if you're left-wing on economics, like Francis clearly is, you're also going to be a big theological liberalizer. Um, so it's confirmed that conservative sense, and it's given liberal Catholics the sense that they don't have to settle necessarily for this sort of you know, this sort of package deal that they can liberal, you know, they can have a church that's on the left on political economy without having to carry so much moral conservative baggage that they're at the very least a little bit uncomfortable with. So I think that's when I talk about missing the Francis opportunity, that's what I feel he's, he's missed, that you could have had a different, a different set of reforms that liberals liked and this more populist economic message that was friendlier to a lot of, especially non-American theological conservatives, friendlier than his pontificate has actually been. And I don't, just on a practical level, I don't understand handing so much of his agenda off to the leaders of the German church, which whatever you think about where liberal theology should go or anything like that,
the German church is just, you know, it's, 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 it's rich and empty, and it's, I don't know what the future of Catholicism is, but it's not, it's not in Germany right yes. now. So <laughs> that's, that's, where I'll, that's where I'll end. But thank you so much for your question, and I'll look for your review. And thank you guys so very much for coming. I really, really appreciate it.